Okay, the clock on the wall says five o'clock, which means we are live. Um, today is Tuesday of week two of AP Live for AP Computer Science A. Welcome back. We are happy that you're with us. Um, we have a lot to share with you today. Um, we, we have been doing some uh, feedback for the quackback forms and and we have quite a bit to share with you we've um, had paper pencil out code out i got chart paper ready oh have we been busy so okay so my name is rob schultz and i'm jill westerlin and welcome um today we're going to talk to you about classes and class implementation but before we get to that we've got some um i don't know what you call it a revisit from yesterday's multiple choice um and we do have some more pins to put on our map but to be honest I was so busy today studying Java, um, uh, like answering some things to bring to y'all that that we don't have any more pins. But I did get a note um, we did from a teacher at a Department of Defense school and who has 102 AP CSA students all over the world. Um, I guess a virtual course for a DOD. So welcome to all the DOD kids all over the place. Um, um, so anyway, we're glad you're with us. And Happy that's that you're with a us. number of our pins. Yeah, everybody. So um, we only have, what, two more days after today. So um, so yesterday we had three Boolean expression multiple choice questions, two, three, and four, and um, got a lot of feedback about these questions. And within the last, I don't know, 45 minutes, um, we, you know, between pencil and paper and JGRASP and whatever, um, we got stuff to bring to you about all of these. So um, question number two from yesterday talks about this Boolean expression, which of the following best describes when it is evaluated to true. So if you go forward one time, we've edited the image to show you what Java is going to read this as. Notice the two new blue parentheses. This is how Java is going to read it. So you want to talk, Mr. Schultz, and then I'm yeah. going to go over here to my chart paper. We okay. have got to add to our PICMOA acronym. Um, this is like a major update. So go ahead and talk. So I got to be honest. Um, when we started hearing some of the feedback, I thought, okay, maybe there is an error with this question. So we went back and looked, and I kind of waffled back and forth. But then I remembered... When we talk precedence and we talk order of operations, equal equal comes before an and symbol. So when I first looked at this, when I started hearing some of the feedback that we had gotten back that we we had an incorrect answer, I got to be honest, I did the same thing. I looked at it and I compared everything that was on the left of the equal equal to everything that's on the right of the equal equal. But then I remembered that equal equal comes before and, which means we're going to evaluate everything in the parentheses, and then we're going to evaluate whether or not it's equal to just A, and that's going to give us a true or a false, and then we're going to take that true false and we're going to, we're going to add the and B. So the answer to this one is actually correct as listed. Um, do, do you think I should put the, the paper pencil work up and just kind of hold it up to, to show? If you want to, and then, and then we'll go, and then I'll show y'all what I'm writing over here. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm laying out a new acronym for the Java order of operation precedent. Um, so y'all, I'm going to write, let Mr. Schultz talk you through this, because this is really important, because number one, we don't want people thinking that AP Classroom's wrong if it isn't wrong. Yeah. And number two, um, this blew past all of us. Yeah. And so we and don't it, want it to blow past you on your exam. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Okay. So looking at this, we've got column A and column B. And and uh, hopefully we're all in agreement that um, A and B or not A would follow and be true, false, 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 as I work my way down comparing the A's and B's. So I'm going to try and look at what I'm holding up to the screen so I can do this at the same time. But then the next thing we do is we evaluate and we compare this column, the A and B or not A, to column A and we're looking for any place where those columns are equal to each other. So you notice that when I do that, we get true, false, true, true. And then finally, we're gonna take that column and compare it. Now I can't see, I'm blocking my little window. We're gonna take that and we're gonna compare it to B. And the only time that column becomes true is when it matches up with B where B is true. So we're not looking for where they're the same. We're looking at an and comparison of this column and our B column. And the only place they match up is right here where B is true and B is true. Okay, so this actually is a correct answer. Um, the, this is gonna evaluate to, uh, this, is, this entire expression is gonna value, evaluate to true only when B is true. Whew. Okay, there we yeah. go, we got that one. 
Um, right, and again, so it's just because of this kind of imaginary parentheses in there because of the precedence that equal equal comes before and. All right, so what I've written up here um, is a new, and I'll take a picture of this, but we still are good with our pick mo. So that's okay, we got pick mo. And then we gotta add in right here, BC for binary comparisons. And that's going to be um, our greater than, less than, you know, less than and equal to, those type of things. Um, and then we have equal, equal, not equal. And that's kind of the order. So it would be like one, two, you know, these things first, um, three, you know, then these as four and five, okay? So it's gonna do the relational first, then that, and then BL is binary logic. And I'm gonna try to write that. Um, Binary logic is going to be double ampersand for and and or. I can't write that on a, a wall sideways. And then the very last thing is assignment. So um, so that's going to be, you know, our, our typical assignment, you know, in Java is an equal sign. Um, so, you know, and I would recommend y'all, you know, of course, use the word becomes, but um, that's beside the point here. So we have PICMO, binary comparisons, binary logic, then assignment. So um, I don't know what we're going to do with that in terms of remembering it. Um, but, you know, lots of people know somebody named Mo. I know somebody named Mo that I taught for a few years and um, he's just wonderful. So maybe I'll remember it. PICMO and then we got to go to to BCBL, I don't know. Somehow or another, that's why you got to remember it from now on. Yeah, but the main um, thing to take away is that equal equal comes before and and or. That's right. So, okay. Um. So question: the answer to this is B, um, and we're all schooled on that now. All right. Number three from yesterday: the answer is B, um, and I think I'm right. Yeah, the answer is B, and B is the answer. Um, and I think our little truth table graphic, you know, will kind of help you break that apart a little bit and look into that. So um, hopefully it will. So. So as we look at this last piece where we're comparing A and then we're comparing that to using an and for not B or A. Remember, the only place this is going to be true is if both of these columns are true. Well, neither is true there, so this would be false. Right. Neither is true there. This would be false. That's going to be false. That's going to be fa false. And it doesn't matter that those are the same. They both have to be true. So the answer yeah. to this one would be <clears throat> the value is always false. And then the next one, number four, uh, many people had issue with this question and thought that it was not the answer A. Um, there are a couple of things you can notice about this question. This has a little bit to do with um, working in and out of the parentheses at how, you know, and and or might work if you take them in reverse. Um, so zero in on answer choice A, which was the answer and the expression that you're given and see if you can kind of notice some things that are going on there in terms of the relationship between the and and the or and the, the not and the not. Um, this would be a question that might take you the whole time that you, you know, your whole three minutes that you're allowed, or you might just see it out of the, out of the, the blue. Yeah. And if you, and if you haven't looked at De Morgan's law yet, Make sure you look up De Morgan's law. De Morgan's law says that if I have um, like an or statement with Boolean expressions and I put a not in front of it, then each of the Boolean conditions changes from either true to false or false to true, or, or I should say I put the not in front of it and then an mm -hmm. or becomes an and. So it looks something kind of yeah. like this. I mean, that's De Morgan's law. So not A or B becomes not A and not B. Um, not A and B becomes not A or not B. Um, so when you apply to Morgan's law through here with all of the different parentheses, um, it does work out to be A. And I've, I've kind of got the breakdown there that I'll hold it up. And if you want to pause on that, you can. And there are a number of really good, um, obviously, this is a college course you're seeking to get credit for. There are a number of good collegiate sources for De Morgan's material that, that you'll be able to find to supplement 
you know, whatever you're doing in your classroom or share with your classmates, um, teachers, you know, pull it together. So I don't think you need to prepare for too many of these types of multiple choice questions. I would guess and say one to three, probably at the most. I don't know, yeah. Mr. Schultz, if you have a thought on that, but that's um, probably about right. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to have 10 of these questions. You're going to have yeah. a very limited number. So, um, you know, practice the way you play. Um, Okay, and then we did have a couple other a couple other questions that popped into the yeah. quackback form. Yeah, how are the labs tested on the AP exam? Um, and talking about Magpie Consumer Picture Lab Stegnography, the things that that we're doing in the classroom. So um, you're not going to have specific exam questions about any particular lab. The concepts that these labs cover, though, are included in the multiple choice and the free response. So the totality of the selection that you might see in Magpie or, um, you know, traversing through the 2D array in Picture Lab or in Stegnography, add on to that. Um, the concepts of that should help you prepare for the free response portions and even the, the, the multiple choice. What do you have to add to that, Mr. Schultz? Oh, uh, I was, you, you yeah. summed it up pretty nicely. I mean, um, anything that you would see in these labs, those are the specific concepts that, that are covered on yeah. the free response question. And hopefully and, they'll and give the you choice. kind of a scope of applying that. And yeah. your teachers probably give you other really nice labs that do the same thing. So, yeah. and your teacher may not have covered any of these exact labs. Do not panic. Your teacher might cover a different, like they may not do the 11s card game lab. Your teacher might teach a different card game lab or, or no card game lab, you know. So um, I'm always trying to think up new labs um, and take a spin on something. So um, whatever you're doing to code will help you um, write code on the free response. All right. Are there specific algorithms that we must have memorized? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I'm going to review them again tomorrow. But last week on it would have been Wednesday. Yes. So be our third day together when we talked about arrays and array list. We went over the algorithms, standard algorithms for arrays. There are about 12 to 13 of them. And that's where I had a, a, a blooper because I said, um, was it mean, medium, mode? And I talked about mode being the average and mode is actually the count of the, the most, um, you know, the most yep. occurring. Um, so um, whoever told us that, I knew I said it later on in the, the thing, but I just didn't go back. But um, there are about 12 when you add them all together. I think they're from like con two I maybe or something. And um, you've got to know those. Um, you've got to know how to find the, the minimum value in a list or an array. And, um, you know, we will go back over them, but I would suggest that you go back to the second, the second, no, the third, what would it be? The third episode from last week. Yeah. So whatever that was, whatever day, yeah. whatever day last um, week was the third day. I don't know what day it is really anymore. We're just going, <laughs> we're just marching on to the AP exams. <laughs> I think All right. It's and I think we had, and I think we had one more. Oh yeah. This is a good one. And this is my segue into Jill's sermon for today. Um, <laughs> can we listen to music during our at-home digital exam? Um, no, you cannot. Jill is telling you that you cannot. Um, you have got to devote all the bandwidth that you have to the exam process. And I would even go so far as to say if other people in your home are working from home, you know, ask them to schedule their lunch break during your AP exam hour or three hours, actually. Um, you know, you've got to have all of of the connection power you need because the AP exams this year are not like last year and you've got to both receive information and give back information. There's got to be a free flow back and forth um, the entire three hours of time. So that kind of leads us into the bit of the day today. Um, well, and I'm, that's I'm where gonna I'm going to piggyback gonna... one thing on that yeah. because you're saying, you're saying make sure that you have bandwidth, but I'm going to say even beyond that, not just internet bandwidth, but also your mental bandwidth. I mean, you want to yeah. be focused on the exam, not focused on the music. So even if you have music on say your phone that, that is saved on your phone and you're not streaming it, you still don't want to be distracted by music. You I'm not be, even sure it's allowed to be honest. You want to be focused. You. I'm, I'm pretty sure maybe it, it isn't even allowed. I'm, yeah, I'm that, not sure. That could be, that could be. <clears throat> 
but yeah, so so I I'm agreeing with Jill. You know, Rob Rob is also saying no, you're you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, whether or not College Board says you're allowed is irrelevant because Jill and Rob have said no. You yeah. Can't do that. Yeah. Okay. Focus on the exam. Make sure you keep your bandwidth as clear as you can. Mm-hmm. Okay. There we go. All right. So here we go. We're on iteration two. We're on day two um, of iteration two, which is our fifth. Uh, two to the fifth power. Um, and today we're going to focus for a bit of the day on the digital exam. So I've got a few reminders and then I'm going to talk talk to you a little bit about this digital testing guide. This digital testing guide is available on AP Central and this, it, this guide covers everything that all students need to know. If you are taking a digital exam in CSA on May the 18th or June the 1st, it is your responsibility to know about everything that's in this digital testing guide. Um, it's available to you and I'm going to give you some big picture items in just a minute. If you have questions or concerns about it, the best person to review that with is your school's AP coordinator. Um, that person is kind of your connection for your testing um, information that's been given to College Board and your, your testing assignment and those types of things. So um, I think there's a couple more things here and then we're going to go to the next. Yeah, Mark, Mark Emery is telling me the same thing. He agrees. Um, CSA are included um, on the exam page. Yeah, I think we're going to have all teachers telling you the same yeah. thing, even teachers who know about music. Yeah. So yeah. Um, on and this is the link on AP Central. Um, and I know it doesn't look pretty, but it's just here. So apcentral.collegeboard.org slash about hyphen AP dash 21 um, slash update slash digital exams. Um, and again, you've got to know about this. And I, I want to zero in right here. There's one more animation, but don't click it yet. Uh, go back one step. Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, Mm, yeah, right there. Go. See right here where I've screen captured this. The digital exam testing guide, which I'm about to show you, provides detailed information, including four steps that students need to take before they can test. Um, the experience, there were technical requirements, accommodations, and policies and procedures. Um, so now go forward one click, and then I'm going to take the screen and show you. Students will need to install the digital exam application on the computer they will use throughout the test. That means you have to do it. If you have a school issued Chromebook, the school has to do it. They have to push out to your school issued Chromebook the application for this digital exam. Um, that means you've got to talk to your AP coordinator. If you're a virtual student and you don't normally go to school, you or your parent has got to get a hold of that person. I would recommend on the phone, two way communication is always better than one way. Um, and come to a meeting of the minds about, if you have a home-owned Chromebook, like you own your own Chromebook that is not connected to your school district at all, you cannot use it for this exam. If you have a home computer, you can use that if you download the proper you know, software and have it all set up. So I think I have two or three little animations here, Mr. Schultz, and then I'm gonna grab the screen. Um, this is not the same testing environment that you tested with last year. So if you took other AP exams or if you took CSA last year and you're retaking it again, um, this is not the same thing. So do not plan to go into a link on exam day and get in there 30 minutes early and it just, it's not that. So. The, the wheel has been reinvented this year. Um, it's, it's new. Um, and again, you've got to install that. So what I'm going to do now. And to the teachers, while you're pulling yeah. that up, to the, <clears throat> teachers, um, to the teachers out there that are listening, you may have noticed if you looked in AP Classroom, there's now an option in AP Classroom that says, uh, I believe it's called the AP Exam Readiness Dashboard, where you can go out and check that and it'll tell you how many of your students have done what they needed to do um, and, and you know, check some things off the list to be prepared for this digital exam. Because as Jill said, I can't, you know, we can't stress this enough. It is not the same thing as last year. This is totally different. You have and to you, be prepared for you it. You don't need to wait till the day before. Like you need to be doing that right now. Um, and you need to make sure you're prepared right now. So, will you yeah. let me grab where I can grab? It won't oh, let me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it letting you take it? Let's see. Um, not yet. Here, I'll stop sharing. Hello. Hi. Um, okay. So this is the digital guide. I downloaded this to my desktop. So you can do the same thing. 
it's pretty long. Um, don't get trapped up in why am I having to do this? Life's not fair. It's not time for that. Like we're we're past that. We're going to go on and be prepared for our exam. So just, you know, handle it. Um, I'm going on down to this is page four and I'm not going to go through all this, but I do want to go through these four steps because they're so important. Number one, download and install the digital testing application and log into it. So you need to go ahead and be doing that. Number two, practice in that digital application with sample questions. So if you are testing at home, you need to go ahead and be getting on top of these four steps, complete the setup and check in the exam. How do I know if I'm taking a digital exam? In AP Classroom, it will tell you already, and you can grab the screen back, Mr. Schultz. Okay. It will tell you in AP Classroom what you're signed up for, like when your next exam day is and what you're signed up to do. So, um, and again, if you don't see it in AP Classroom and you're not sure and you want to talk to a live human and get verification, your AP coordinator at your school that you're affiliated with is the person. Do you need me to unshare? Yes, please. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so use that resource. Um, if you receive testing accommodations, that will be set up for you already. You don't have to worry about any of that. Um, that will be a part of your digital exam. So that was a part of that that other note that I shared earlier. So um, I just wanted to make sure that I covered that as well. So today we are moving on to some other skills. Um, we're still kind of in column five a little bit and then jumping back into one and two. Primarily we're talking about classes today or we're, we're trying to, um, but classes are about everything. So um, we're gonna hit on a lot of topics today. So here are the practices and skills, um, particularly the skills that that the multiple choice and the content review from today are covering um, for. And I've circled 1A, even though it's not assessed, determining appropriate program code to solve a problem. Um, that's indirectly assessed really on everything. Um, you know, you've got to come up in your own mind with that when you're getting ready to do anything in column three. So um, we're specifically gonna talk about classes and super classes and subclasses and inheritance and some of those things that we didn't cover last um, day two last week. So, all right, let's look at um, our review for today. So I'm gonna go to Jay Grasp in just a minute, which is the editor that I like to use. And I'm gonna show you a case study that we put together about ducks and rubber ducks and we liked it because y'all may have a rubber duck so um we thought that would be a fun one to do um there you go mr schultz has a duck call so the duck class is our super class rubber duck and mallard duck are kinds of ducks they are of the duck type um, and they both will extend that i'm going to give you the code to this after the session today hoping that you will play around with it and kind of work through some of the things today that might be, you know, a little bit of a challenge. I'm also going to give you another one as well. Um, we're going to look at objects and, and look at some methods. So let me get my, my screen changed. Um, okay. I'll stop sharing so you can take over. Okay. Um, oh, I've got it on the wrong screen. Here we go. Okay. Um, sorry, y'all. I have to talk myself through things. You don't want to hear that. Okay, so you do not have to use JGRASS, remember. Um, it is free. I like it. I think Mr. Schultz uses it as well. It works with a lot of, of systems. It, um, but, um, and you can see over here where we're going on Thursday a little bit with recursion. But um, in JGRASS, you can make something called a project. So you go to project, new project. And I have associated these three files together in a project. The beauty of that is because they're associated in, in a project, you could kind of do the same thing if they were in the same folder. So if you're thinking that in your head, you don't have to do it that way. I know you don't, but it's nice if you do. Um, JGRASS will make the connection graphically with a UML diagram to show us that the duck class um, is the super class and these others um, extend from it. They both happen to have a main. So that's one thing that you can do um, to look at that. So here in the duck class, and you're going to see this in code in just a minute when Mr. Schultz goes over um, overloading. I've, we've got some things. A lot of these rubber ducks 
have a costume like this one happens to be Wonder Girl. Um, it's one that I have. Mr. So- oh, I love that little hat. Mine so a lot funny. of them have um, glasses or sunglasses. Sometimes they have a hat on their head. Um, so that's something that they have. And so those are some of the things that we pulled. Now it's grabbing in. We talked about this last week. The super class contains a name method. And so um, that one's being inherited in. And then it makes noise and there's a two string and I've put in some objects. One thing I wanted to talk to you about, and this will come up today, is what I've done here on lines 54 and 56. So Rubber Duck Jill is a new rubber duck with a name, um, no sunglasses, yes to headgear, headwear. Um, Headgear reminds me of getting braces. I had to wear that back in the day. Um, And then a nickname would be Jill. All right, so Jill is a rubber duck of the rubber duck type. Then we have this line of code here in line 56, and I'm gonna let Mr. Schultz piggyback. But what this is, is it's a duck object named Hunter, who is a new rubber duck, which is remember the subclass, duck was our super class. And it has the same, you know, nickname, attribute, false, true, whatever. Um, so the, the, the way this behaves is it is a duck object. But if rubber duck has some overloaded methods, so there's a method in rubber duck and there's a method up here in duck that are overloaded. So they have the same name. Overridden. Overridden. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Overridden. We're going to get into that. They have the same name, but a different behavior type, a different implementation type. They, they do something different. It's going to um, implement the method from the lowest level associated class. So Mr. Schultz, talk about some of your examples and I'm gonna well, leave this code on the screen. We, we do an example in my class where we start with a, a doctor class. So a general doctor, like my family doctor, who and I can, can write this on the chart paper di- while you're Diagnose talking. basic illnesses. Let um, me quit take- Sharon and I'm gonna go to the chart paper. No, oh, it'll okay. talk about, it'll do you. So you, oh, okay. you do, I'm gonna write. Um, so, so a, a doctor can do doctor things, just generic doctor things. Let's well, then that below works. that, you might have a um, cardiologist that's a very specific type of doctor. So cardiologist extends doctor, can do all of the doctor things, but a cardiologist can do heart surgery. And we have a neurologist, which is a very specific type of doctor. They can do all of the doctor things, but they also do brain surgery. So it, even though a cardiologist might take your temperature differently, might diagnose illnesses differently, they might have those methods overridden. There are specific things that only a cardiologist can do. So, uh, so if I create a, a doctor, you know, doctor, my doc equals new doctor, that doctor is defined as a doctor and can do doctor things, anything that the doctor can do. If I create a doctor, doc two equals new cardiologist, a cardiologist is a type of doctor, but the compiler is going to look at that and say, okay, but this is defined as a doctor, so we can still only do doctor things. If a cardiologist does doctor things differently, in other words, it's an overridden method, then it's going to look in the cardiologist class for that overridden method, and it's going to work its way up. If it can't find the method in the cardiologist class, it'll take the method from the doctor class. So it'll look to the lowest if there are overridden ones that are in both, Um, but it is whatever type of object the class is on its left when it is declared is the type that it actually is. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Um, So I'm gonna bow back to my screen share here and show y'all a couple more things. And then Mr. Schultz is gonna review um, the overriding with with our ducks. So, um, So, You've got the duck class over here. Um, It's pretty simple. It's the super class. So it's got a few methods. It makes some noise. It does some things. Ducks quack. Um, Rubber ducks um, squeak. They do not quack. And then um, mallards, I forgot what they do. Mallards go in different directions. And because some of you might not be using an editor, Um, and you might be using an online browser, it might be a little more difficult to manipulate a project with multiple class files. So I went back from last year and found our animal class case study. Last spring, we did a whole, you know, multi-week 
I don't even know what extravaganza of animals. And so um, I went back and found one of these. And so this is a public class animals, but within this one same file, we have hippos and giraffes. And um, I thought maybe, yeah, we have wild animals that are a type of animal. And then under wild, we have hippos and we have giraffes because of course they live in the wild. Um, so this is a multi-level inheritance all in one file um, that you could, you know, experiment with the code for this if that works better for you than building out the duck, the mallard, and the rubber duck. So I'm going to put all of these files in today's resources folder, and we'll share that link again at the end of, of the session. But the resources link is also down in the description area in YouTube. So right below where you're watching us, there's a big long description about a lot of things about what we're doing and that link to the resources folder is also there. So, so um, that's what I wanted to show you about the code. And um, hopefully after you watch today's session, you're gonna get kind of get your hands dirty with this code to practice what we're preaching about today. Okay, take it away, Mr. Schultz with this part. And then we're gonna come back to me for multiple choice. Actually, I think multiple choice is next. Do you want to keep? Oh, going? is it? Or do you want to? Do you want to do? Let, let's jump ahead to the inheritance, and then we'll come back since okay. we want to roll with that. Okay. So I'm going to move forward here just real quick. Don't look at any of this. Close your eyes. Look away. We'll come back. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. So what I want to focus on specifically is kind of piggybacking off of what Jill just said. I want to look specifically at overloading versus overriding because that can be very confusing for all of us. I catch myself all of the time just absent-mindedly saying one word instead of the other when I'm teaching my class. Um, so. As we're looking at this duck class, you know, we have a duck class that has one private instance variable name. It's a string. We have our constructors. We have a get name method, a set name method, and a make noise method. So if I go out and I say duck D1 equals new duck named Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Um, D1 is going to make noise, and it's going to call the make noise method and say quack. Does everything it's supposed to. OK, but now let's imagine that we have below that a rubber duck that extends duck. So in this case, we're going to add another instance variable that only exists for rubber ducks. We have our constructors, we have a git costume, and we have a make noise. So notice now I have a make noise method in my rubber duck class as well. So if I say rubber duck D2, D2 equals new rubber duck Maggie, and we say D2.git name, well, it's going to look down here and it's not going to find a get name method so it's going to work its way up the tree and it's going to pull the get name method from the duck class and the name is maggie um, if i tell duck d2 to make noise again it's going to start at the lowest level of the tree and it's going to look for the make noise method here which overrides the method from above and it's going to say squeak instead of quack because rubber ducks squeak okay so there's one of our lower classes a subclass OK, but now let's say we add another class. I'm going to move my little window with our faces out of the way. Um, and we're going to say mallard extends duck. So uh, as Jill said before, the difference with mallard ducks is we can actually tell them to move. We have a row and a column so we can keep track of, of where they are. We can keep track of what direction they're facing. So I can set the direction, get location. I can tell it to move a specific distance in whatever direction it's facing, or I can tell it to move to a specific set of coordinates on a little grid. OK, so now if I go out and say mallard D3, D3 equals new mallard Jamie, um, D3.get name is going to, again, go to the top of the tree and get the get name method. So we're going to get Jamie. Um, if I go in and I tell uh, D3 to make noise, well, there's no make noise method in my mallard class, which this is. So it's going to go up the tree and it's going to pull the make noise method from duck. So just like every other duck other than our rubber duck, it's going to quack. Um, then I can say, OK, well, let's get Jamie's location. Let's get D3's location. And by default, we're going to assume that D3 starts at the middle of an XY grid, so 0, 0. And then I can say, OK, let's set the direction to 0, 0.0. Um, I can call the move method and say, OK, let's move in that direction 8. So we'll call our move method. And then if I call get location again, it should tell us that we've moved 8 along the x-axis. So we're at 8, 0. But now I can say, OK, let's move directly to coordinate 6, 7. And if I say get location, it'll now tell us that, that our duck, Jamie, has moved to coordinate 6, 7. OK, so 
that's kind of the direction, you know, I'm pulling all of these extra things that only a mallard has because duck D3 is a mallard, but everything still kind of falls into this hierarchy. And what I really wanted to focus on was the fact that as we look at these methods in the rubber duck class, we have a make noise method that overrides the make noise method in the duck class. Over here in the mallard class, we have two move methods that aren't overridden because I don't have them up above, but they are the same name with different parameters, which means they're overloaded methods. So there's a difference between overridden and overloaded. Overridden is when I override a method that comes from a superclass by coming up with my own set of instructions for that method. Overloaded is when I have multiple methods with the same name, but different parameter lists. Okay. So that's None my big a lot That's of this code is not in what you're going to open. So you can rewatch all of what Mr. Schultz just went over and make the Jamie duck and do the moving and do the, the make noise. And, you know, you can absolutely work through that. Yeah. So and even there some are some things, things, but there, you know, there aren't these exact things. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So let's jump to, uh, let's jump back up to multiple choice. So bear with me as I yeah. work my way back Close up. Close your eyes. Choice. I always tell my class, I'll just go on and tell y'all because, you know, that's how it I'm like. Um, it, overriding is like when, you know, we dye our hair. You know, our hair is a certain color, but I'm going to override the color of my hair, what it would normally be with what I want it to be. So that's another way that you can think about overriding. Okay. There you go. Everyday lesson. Okay, multiple choice number one. Um, this one, you might want to grab your Java quick reference or Maggie's going to remind you a little bit. So unpack that just a couple. Um, substring, there are two um, overloaded substring. There's a from two and a from only. And then length, my, what does minus one mean in terms of a, a string or an array? And then what index of returns is an int? So um, this is your softball question for today. Okay, there's the next one. All right, this one, um, car dealership, this is a little kind of um, program design. So you're not really writing code here. You're just looking at this as a programmer, which you are, and thinking about um, what is the best way to solve this scenario in code. So, and if you'll kind of, after you read it, Mr. Schultz can kind of pop through the five answers um, so that you can kind of distinguish one from the other. Yeah. So they kind so, of so there's A. B has four unrelated classes. C uses a car class with three subclasses. D uses a car class with a subclass doors, a subclass air conditioning, and a subclass miles per gallon. And E uses three classes, each with a subclass car. So how would the hierarchy for that work out? What would that look like? All right. And here's number three. Yeah, this is a missing code to complete the programming statement. We haven't shown y'all too many of these types of questions. So it's also a Roman numeral question. So remember, um, and I think we can pop through that, Mr. Schultz. Um, whenever you see a Roman numeral question, you're evaluating Roman numeral one, true or false, Roman numeral two, true or false, and Roman numeral three, true or false. And do that work before you look at the answer choices. Go ahead and do the, the thinking through each Roman numeral independently before you consider your options. All right, and here's number four. And this gets exactly at the whole um, duck, whatever equals new rubber duck. Um, oh, yeah. You know. Um, and we can't reference dogs without throwing in our dog pictures. That's right. So, so here's yeah. Bo and JJ and us. <laughs> So the next one, um, here's the code. And then your actual question is, if we declare a dog Fido equals new underdog, that object, um, remember what we told you, it is a dog object um, that also um, has the new underdog as a part of its instantiation. So um, when it calls Fido at, what's it going to look to first and then 
the answer choices should pop up one more. One more item there. There's a little animation to kind of connect some dots. There we go. Yeah. There we go. What's it going to do? All right. So those are your four multiple choice questions for tonight. Oh, my soul. It is already 440. What are you going to do, like speed talk? Y'all are going to have to not speed up the YouTube. Yeah, you're, when you're you, actually you going to have to slow this down to half speed so it'll it'll sound normal. No, I won't, <sighs> I won't talk that fast. Um, we'll, we'll kind of write this up. We took some extra time to go over the multiple choice questions at the beginning, and that's why we know you want us to go over multiple choice questions, but we haven't been taking the time to go over those just because we're, we've got limited time. So yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. We're going to go a little over today um, because we took some extra time to add the multiple choice. Yeah. Hydrate so you can. OK, here we go. Hit it. Um, we are looking at the 2019 free response question number two. This is the step tracker question. And if you happen to have um, a, a, a device like you have a, a phone that tracks your steps or if you have a little you know, wristband that tracks your steps, um, this is essentially what we're writing a little program to simulate. We're going to write a question. Uh, or we're going to write a program that involves um, implementation of a fitness tracking system that's represented by the step tracker class. So they don't give us the class definition for this one. That's our job. Our job is to write the entire class based on all of the little clues they give us in this information. So they tell us a step tracker object is created with a parameter that defines the minimum number of steps that must be taken for a day to be considered active. So they're giving us some hints. At the point when we create a new step tracker object, when we instantiate that object, there's going to be one parameter we're going to pass in that's going to be a value that represents the minimum number of steps to be considered active. And then it goes on and tells us our step tracker class has to provide a constructor and the following methods, add daily steps, which accumulates information about steps in readings taken once per day, active days, which returns the number of active days, and average steps, which returns the average number of steps per day calculated by dividing the total number of steps taken by the number of days tracked. So if you read through here carefully and you go through and you, you um, underline, you can look at all of the instance variables we need. There are actually four different things we need to keep track of. We need to keep track of the minimum number of steps. We need to keep track of a total number of steps. We need to keep track of an, uh, the number of active days, and we need to keep track of the total number of days. Okay, so those are our four things we're looking for. And then they give us some information that kind of shows us what happens as we instantiate one of these objects. So we do step tracker tr equals new step tracker. So here's where we're calling our constructor. So we kind of get a snapshot of, of what the constructor needs to look like. And notice we're passing in an integer value. Um, days with at least 10,000 steps are considered active. Assume that the parameter is positive. And then we call tr.activedays. Active days returns a value. But in this case, again, notice that it's giving us an integer value. It's returning 0. Oops, forgot I had those little arrows there. It's returning 0 because we didn't have any data. Uh, we, we haven't recorded any data yet. If I call average steps at this point, Notice this one's giving us a decimal value. So if I'm looking for an average, we have to use double arithmetic to make sure we get a double value answer. But then I say, OK, today's the, the end of my first day. Let's add our daily steps. Today I took 9,000 steps. Well, 9,000 is going to be below 10,000. So it's too few to be considered active. But I still have to register that number of steps, and I have to register the number of days. Um, here's day two. We added 5,000 steps. So at this point, if I call active days, it's still 0. We haven't had a single day yet where I've had at least 10,000 steps. Um, if I call my average steps, it is going to calculate and tell me that we had 7,000 steps. That's the average of 9,000 and 5,000. Um, then I have on day three, I run th uh, or I walk 13,000 steps. Well, that is over my $10,000 minimum, my $10,000, my 10,000 step minimum. Um, so if I call active days, we have now one day where we've, we've been considered active. And I can continue to work my way through this little, this little simulation um, and figure out exactly you know, where everything goes. But I think that's a pretty good idea. The only other thing I'm going to throw down here is just make sure that we keep track. The average number of steps per day is going to be uh, 51,111 at this point based on the information that I've given it. And if I divide by five, remember in Java, an integer divided by an integer gives us an integer and we want a decimal value. So we have to be careful to take that into account as we go on that last step, okay? So as we've done in the past, I think it's helpful if we look at where the point values are. And again, because this is just one single question where we're doing the entire class from top to bottom, 
all nine points are going to be built into how we build this class. So there's one point for declaring all of the appropriate private instance variables. And again, I want to focus on something we mentioned yesterday and we mentioned at least once last week. As you're looking through these questions, any place you see that the font is different, that's important. Okay, that means that's something that specifically has to be there. So, um, so as we score this, that's something that the readers are looking for. It means that all those instance variables have to be private in order to earn this point. For the constructor, we have to have a correct header. It has to be public step tracker. Now, yesterday in our in our um, in our Quackback form, somebody asked if we could change the method header or we could change the parameter name to make it a little shorter. Well. In this case, we weren't given specific method headers. We know what a header has to look like, and we were told specifically what the class uh, the class name is, which means our constructor has to have the same name. But we weren't given a specific header that included parameters, which means as long as we give it an int, we can name this parameter whatever we want in this case because it wasn't previously defined in the problem the problem setup. Um, once we define the header for our constructor, we have to use the parameter and appropriate values to initialize all of the instance variables. For the next three points, we focus on our add daily steps method. That was one that was specified has to be there. So we have to have an appropriate header, public void. It doesn't return anything, but we're going to add daily steps. We're going to give it an integer value that represents the number of steps we took that day. We have to identify whether or not it's considered an active day, and we increment a counter. And then we have to update all of our other instance variables appropriately. Um, we have a method active days. And for this one, um, it was just one point for the active days method because really all it's going to do is just tell us how many active days we had. So we have to declare and implement public int active days. And then finally, we've got the last two points for our average steps method. We have to declare the correct header, and then we have to return a calculated double average number of steps. Now, before I go into this and I show you the solution, I'm going to tell you that um, you know every year there's what's considered a canonical solution. It's the the solution that we kind of use as the benchmark because um, you know there have been years where the canonical solution is the most common solution. There have been years where the canonical solution is the most efficient solution. I remember the year of this question. It was like there was kind of an unofficial canonical uh, canonical question. There was the canonical, which I'm going to show you, and then there was another one that we saw a lot of students do where they did something totally different. So I just want to reiterate that what I'm going to show you, this is not the only one correct answer. You could do this question and solve this question correctly and get every point on this rubric doing things a little bit differently, um, and you would still get full credit as long as it meets the requirements, as long as that it doesn't violate any of the conditions of the question, um, as long as everything does what it's supposed to, you're still going to get full credit. Okay. So here is what's considered the canonical solution. So the first part. You know, we've got our private instance variables. We've got minimum steps. We've got our total steps. We've got the number of days, which is our total number of days. And then we've got the number of active days. And we also have a constructor that takes our threshold. It takes an integer value. We set min steps equal to that threshold and we initialize everything else to zero. So it's kind of like I just opened a little fitness tracker out of the box. I put it on my wrist um, and I set it up for the very first time. I'm telling it what I want my conditions to be for a minimum, you know, the minimum number for active days. But at this point, I haven't taken a single step. So number of days, number of active days, total steps, those all get set to zero. And if we think about those point values, we've declared all of our appropriate private instance variables. We've got a correct header, public step tracker, int threshold, and remember the, the constructor header, um, there's no return type, and the name has to be a match for our class. And then we use the parameter that we've got, whatever the name of the parameter was, and we initialize whatever our correct variable was, and we also set all of the other variables to zero. We initialize all of our instance variables. So we've got our first couple points taken care of. Then we look at add daily steps. Um, and with add daily steps, we tell it what the number of steps were we took that day. We have to increment our total number of steps. We have to increment number of days. And then we have to determine whether the number of steps that I'm reporting are enough to consider this an active day. And we have to increment a counter. So we have a correct header, public void add daily steps with an integer parameter. Again, I can name it whatever I want because that wasn't specified in the problem. I'm identifying active days by saying steps greater than or equal to min steps, and then I'm incrementing my counter, my number of steps. And then I'm updating all of the other instance variables appropriately. I'm adding my number of steps to the total, and I'm incrementing the number of days. So we've got everything set with that one. OK, like I said, with active days, all we're really doing is returning the number of active days. So as long as I declare it correctly and I return the number of active days without making any changes, we get this point. And then finally, 
we have our average number of steps. So uh, I have my, my method header, public double average steps. Again, there's no parameter because I'm just asking for the average number of steps. And then return the calculated double average number of steps. And I have to make sure I'm casting correctly. If I put parentheses around the division, then I'm going to be doing integer division and taking an integer answer to cast as a double. So I need to take one of these, either total steps or num days, and cast as a double, or both, if you want to be sure. But I need to take at least one of these and cast it as a double. So when I do the calculation, and I remember the question came up a lot. Well, are we not assessing a point for whether or not they check for number of days equals zero? And in this case, the 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 official word was that's being assessed in in the two. 2019 exam that was being assessed in another question. So that was not one of the nine points that was being assessed on this one. So if a student forgot to do if num days equals zero, return 0, 0.0, they did not lose a point for that because it wasn't something that was being assessed on this question. Okay, so um, so there's our free response question for the day. Um, like I said, there are a lot of different ways you could solve this. There were um, the the other canonical solution actually used um, array lists and and kept track of everything in a single array list, but it still met all of the requirements because of the way they used the values in the array list and and kept track of all of the things that they needed to keep track of. So it's interesting because um, this is question two, so you wouldn't think. Yeah, to throw in an array list, but it really was a, a cool solution the way they did it. The way they did it, it was actually more of like a true fitness tracker where you can go in and you can actually look and see how many steps you walked on each day. So, or, uh, yeah, so each element of the array list represented a separate day that you could go back and check and see how many days you walked answer. each day. And then they would go through and when they needed to calculate the total, they would traverse the array list and add them all up and they would check as they traversed it to see they, they would get a count for how many. So, I mean, it was really a cool solution. It was it was, you know. And, and they met every single requirement on the rubric. They just did it maybe in a different order or they, they checked for things maybe in a different method, but it was really slick the way they did it. Okay, so before we leave this page, y'all, I want you to digest this because it's our last time together looking at a class. Um, this does not have anything to do with an inheritance diagram. Like there's no subclass in play here. Um, it's just taking the information given to you about the step tracker scenario and all of the different calls and designing a class from scratch that meets that. Um, remember, um, if you're testing no matter which day, you're gonna have to write everything you see there in that, that background picture from public class step tracker on down. You're gonna write all the class headers, um, you know, all the method headers. So this is really the class name, the instance variables, the constructor, which is a type of method, and then three methods that you're writing to make all of those calls that Mr. Schultz went through possible. So they give you kind of the, the answer in this question, and you've got to provide kind of the guts to it to make it all work is kind of the way I'm looking at it, you know? Yep. Um, you know, so, um, so you can do this is my point. Um, Absolutely. If you kind of take a deep breath and read the scenario, use your scratch paper, use the margins, write, circle, you know, whatever. Um, well, and the other thing I want to point out is remember what I said last week, that this is not an all or nothing type, you know, the free response questions aren't an all or nothing type thing. So if you know what the method headers are going to be, write the method headers. If you go back and think about what the rubric had together, you know, we had, um, we had a, a method header for the constructor. We had a method header for the add daily. We had a method header that it was just a point for writing the method header. So if you gave these three headers, then that was three of the nine points. If, if you know that this is supposed to return a specific value, you could write that method and get one point. Um, if, if you just know what the instance variables are, the instance variables were worth one, one point. So if you do any of those pieces, even if you don't remember the rest, even if you're not sure maybe what to do inside add daily steps, you can still create the method header for add daily steps and get one of the points for that. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Huh. Okay. Lots to quack us back about maybe, um, you know, we have two more days, so if you've got something pressing in, you know, question you want answered that we might can hunt up the answer for, um, let us know. Today we did talk about many forms of making objects, so Maggie's thinking about all her new duck friends. Um, what should you take away? Overloading versus overriding. Overloading, same name, different method signature, so different number of parameters, different order of parameters. Overriding, 
same name, same signature, different implementation. One quacks, one squeaks, um, one howls, one barks. And um, you can read the rest. Um, class implementation can include creating the class methods, um, you know, working with many forms of different objects and their relationships. And your free response question number two will be about a class. And you will see multiple choice questions um, that could involve, you know, a hierarchy. Um, so array and array list is tomorrow. Um, I will quickly pop up the search and sort algorithms, the ones you have to know. Um, I don't want to say memorize because you need to do more than memorize them because you need to know when they're applicable um, to a scenario. So you need to know more than just, you know, memorizing them. Um, a quick revisit on that. We have a whole search and sort extravaganza. So you do not want to miss tomorrow. It is going to be epic. It's going to be very good. We're real excited about it. So, you know, if nothing else, just, you know, bear with us while we, you know. They're, they're probably going to tune in tomorrow and go, really? That's what they were so excited about? I know. About. We're but real excited about it. We are excited about it. That's right. It's going to be cute. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about string equals again. And the resources folder, I'm going to put ducks and animals in there as soon as we finish today. So you can open those and, you know, mess around with them to make different things and, and watch how the the method calls work to help you prepare for those kind of um, tedious multiple choice type scenarios, um, you know. All so. right. Boy, we have covered a Ooh, lot today. I can't um, believe we made it. So we thank you. Well, we're, we're a little over, but that's OK. Yeah. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Thanks, everyone. No matter where you are, where you That's happen right. to be, what time it is in your time zone, thank you for, for tuning in yeah. either, either live or remotely. And we will see you all tomorrow. See you tomorrow.